Howdy folks, Amy from Amygdala Vids here. Now, I love reading Plato, not because I necessarily agree with him a lot, but because his writing is super interactive and engaging. For those who don't know, Plato writes in a dialogue form, so it kind of reads like you're reading a play. Furthermore, the characters he uses are based off of real people. I heard it described somewhere that Plato is pretty much just writing fan fiction. Plato uses the figure of Socrates usually as his mouthpiece for his own ideas, which will become relevant in this video. This style of philosophical writing is something I love because you get to see differing ideas and debate. Granted, Socrates usually wins out in the end because Plato obviously wants his ideas to shine, but in order to get there, Plato takes you on this argumentative journey that's really fun to follow, which will also be shown in this video. So love. Love is a subject that we could all relate to and probably have some fun party stories about. Speaking of parties, Plato's symposium takes place at a party. Basically, a bunch of guys, including poets, doctors, and our friend Socrates, get drunk and each give speeches regarding love. Now the earlier speeches are interesting in themselves, but I want us to focus in on the question, why do we love? And Plato's answer to this question. Now, although I don't agree with Plato, I'm not going to tell you my critique. No. To really get the most out of this, I think you guys should critique Plato's argument yourself, and post your response in the comments below. So without further ado, get out your note-taking materials, get your brain ready to use its imagination and critical thinking, and enjoy this segment from Plato's Symposium. So after hearing a bunch of other speeches on love, the host of the party, Agathon, gives his speech. What's important is the conclusion that Agathon reaches, that love is beauty. Sounds reasonable at first, I mean, seeing two people in love, especially in old age for some reason, that's a beautiful thing. But uh oh. Here comes Socrates, as usual, about to ruin everything. So Socrates asks Agathon, Isn't love a love of something? Or can love exist without something to be loved? Like, think of a father or a brother. You can't be a father in isolation. No, you need to be a father of someone to be a father. So love means love of something rather than love of nothing, right? Agathon agrees. So since love is a love of something, what is that thing? Do we love and desire things that are in our possession, or things that are not in our possession? Agathon responds that we probably love and desire things that are not in our possession. In our world, we could see this in the idea of simps who love and desire people who they cannot have, like famous Twitch streamers. Now Socrates agrees that it's certain that we love and desire things we don't have. But he asks, what about those who are strong, yet still wish to be strong? or people who are rich and still wish to be rich. Socrates says that these people desire to have the continuance of one's present blessings. For example, if I started dating Mary Elizabeth Winstead, hey come on, I said if, it's a hypothetical. Anyways, if I started dating Mary Elizabeth Winstead and desired that we stayed together, that'd be a desire of something I don't have yet since it is future oriented and not in the present. So Socrates sums this all up by saying, quote, love exists only in relation to some object, and that that object must be something of which he is at present in want. Agathon agrees to all this. Now this is where Socrates activates his trap card. Working off of Agathon's conclusion that love is beauty, Socrates asks, okay, if that's so, love is in love with beauty and not in love with ugliness, right? Agathon agrees. Socrates then returns to their premise that love is being in love with something that he does not possess. Agathon agrees as he already had. Then it follows that love lacks and does not possess beauty. And because, as Socrates says, you wouldn't call something that lacks beauty beautiful, love is therefore not beauty. Agathon concedes his conclusion. So at this point, Socrates and Agathon have come to the conclusion that love is not beauty, but more importantly, Love is love of something that one does not have in the present. That's the golden conclusion you should focus on for now. So it's Socrates' turn to speak now, and he'll be working off this conclusion. Socrates retells the tale of a conversation on love he had with a lady named Diatima. Now there's a lot of goodies inside this exchange, but as to the title of the video, let's focus on the discussion regarding the aim of love. So Socrates straight up asks Diatima what is the aim of love. Initially, they agree on the idea that the aim of love is possession of the beautiful, but returning to the golden conclusion from Socrates and Agathon's dialogue, 
They also add that love is not only possession of the beautiful, but the perpetual possession of the beautiful, so that a person may have that beauty in the future as well. To sum it up, love is the perpetual possession of the beautiful. Now you may be going, big deal, so what? This isn't that crazy. Oh, but here we go, folks. This is where Plato goes hard. I bet you won't expect where he goes with this argument, and if it does surprise you, hit that like button, subscribe, and hit the bell. So now that we have our new golden conclusion that love is the perpetual possession of the beautiful, what then is the function of this love? Plato's answer, as spoken through Diotima, is procreation and immortality. Let's break it down. Diotima says all men have that procreative impulse to have kids, but this can only be done in beauty and not ugliness. Furthermore, in procreation, you bring about a mortal who is, quote, endowed with a touch of immortality. Thus, the object of love is to procreate and bring about beauty and immortality. Since the aim of love is the perpetual possession of the beautiful, it must follow that it must desire immortality along with the beautiful. Love then is the love of immortality as well as of the beautiful. Now this is a crazy conclusion, so let's look at some examples. Plato explains that humans have a natural desire to become immortal, not in a direct way, but in a more abstract way. He points out our love of fame and desire for glory so that we will be immortalized and remembered as a good. But the other way to achieve this immortality is to have kids. Now it's a little unclear for me if Plato means this in a collective way, where the human race achieves immortality this way, or if it's more individualized, in the sense that you achieve immortality through having kids that are a part of your family and contain a part of you. Either way, in Plato's view, immortality is achieved through procreation. And if love is the perpetual possession of the beautiful, then we love in order to achieve immortality through procreation. Well, there's the long, extensive argument. Again, I ain't giving you any hints as to my own critique of this argument. I think you'll benefit the most in terms of critical thinking if you yourself find the flaws. I would also suggest reading the symposium for yourself if you're interested. We just addressed one specific argument in the book. We didn't even get to Diotima's ladder or the original human speech of Aristophanes. Also, it's super short, just a little over 100 pages. Anyways, that's gonna do it for me. Damn, this took a long time to make. Give me a sub and a like if you enjoyed, and hit the bell to stay updated for more content.